Good morning. Is that working for you? How's that? Good. Good. Uh, my name's Peter Moore. I, I'm uh, the chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. This is Betsy Bankin. We're going to give you a, a we're going to do a bit of tag teaming here, and we're both going to present a little bit of a talk. And I thought we want to just give you a very quick five-minute snapshot of the uh, of the Center for Virtual Care. And you know, my you know, uh, it, it's I'm kind of like the father figure of the place, so I get to take all the uh, all the compliments and have none of the responsibilities of the place. Betsy really runs the, the center as the Center for Virtual Care. But my real job is uh, as a chair of a department, of a clinical department, and uh, providing care to patients. So I want to bring you, uh, start off in the real world, what we're doing, what our issues and concerns are, and, 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 bring, and then bring forward uh, uh, how, how we go about our business uh, of teaching uh, residents and medical students. Uh, so, you know, you, conferences like this, you hear about, a lot about paradigm shifts and so forth, but uh, essentially in a few moments, uh, you know, I'll just fill you in on what's happening in medicine. The Institute of Medicine from the National Academy of Sciences came out with a series of reports starting in 19, late 1999. The first report was uh, to air as human, and they brought forward the point that, that the me uh, practice of medicine in this country was really significantly flawed, and in fact, they estimated somewhere between uh, 44,000 to 98,000 patients died every year due to medical errors. To put that into perspective, if you take the high number, that means that, uh, uh, that, that we, we, we physicians and nurses kill more people than felons on the streets, significantly more, yet we don't have any outrage about, uh, about, uh, about safety. But, however, this, this particular fi uh, news hit, the, hit widely and really we identified uh, that we had to make some changes. The Institute of Medicine put out a second report about two years later uh, called, uh, uh, and, and the title of that one was building, uh, was Bridging the Quality Chasm, and a lot of things have flown from that. Uh, the building the Quality Chasm really defined, redefined the way we practice medicine. We moved away from a symptoms, disease, diagnosis, uh, therapeutics approach to a totally different way of looking at patient care and how we provide care. At the same time, the way we train and educate folks, we said, it's not good enough now to go and read about diseases and treatments and so forth. We really have to look at how we train a competent workforce. And so this really propels a lot of the things that we do. And, and, a, and a new thought has come up, how can we combine these thoughts into some sort of a matrix? And I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of where, where we're coming from in terms of the care that we provide people and how we teach folks. So, so the Institute of Medicine defined patient, the aims of patient care in these terms, that we want to provide safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, patient-centered care. And the, 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 the uh, AAMC, the Association of Academic Medical Centers, uh, uh, and through, it, through its org various component organizations said, these are the competencies that we want folks to practice with, and we want you to train and educate people to practice these competencies, and then through a lifelong learning process, continue to do so for the remainder of their their professional life. And so the way I look at this is patient care is these are the things we must do when we take care of patients. We must have safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable patient-centered care. The medical, the knowledge that we carry, it's not just medical knowledge, it's knowledge about our society and people and, 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 uh, and a, a wide range of, of knowledge, is what we must know for this individual patient. What, what are the things we need to know to be able to, to deliver the care appropriately and safely? And then interpersonal skills and communication. How do we talk to each other? How do we talk to the patient? How do we talk to their family members? How do we interact with them and communicate? Professionalism is how we act, how we, how, what, what, what values we carry forward in our interactions with, uh, with patients and family members and our colleagues. Systems-based practice sounds very complicated, but it really comes down to who do we depend upon to provide good care and who depends on us, the decisions we make in ensuring that patients have safe, effective care. And then finally, practice-based learning and improvement is a reflective process. We reflect on how the experience went, and we, and we learn from that experience. We, th we look at the things we do well, the things that we can improve upon, and, and, we, and we take those messages with us, and we continue that with every, every patient contact for the remainder of our life. So this is kind of the way I think about, about how we move forward in, our, in, 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 in the Center for Virtual Care and in our daily practice uh, of, of medicine. I want to give you a case presentation. 
And I want to tell you about a patient, and I want to tell you about, about the issues with this patient. And I'm not going to go into great detail about it all because there's a lot of big words and terms in there. But this is a 56-year-old uh, East Indian woman uh, living in the Central Valley who presents to a local physician with pelvic pain uh, and some vaginal bleeding. She's postmenopausal. She thinks it's maybe something happening again with her periods, but in actual fact, it's not, it's not consistent with that kind of history. And she has a past medical history of uh, scleroderma. That's a disease of the connective tissues that uh, causes uh, the tissues to lose their elasticity and, uh, and, 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 uh, and they become very poorly compliant so you can't stretch your skin and so forth as well. It can also affect the systemic organs as well, the, the heart, lungs, uh, uh, the lungs, kidneys in particular. But in this case, it's primarily uh, to, uh, affecting her skin. Uh, she has diabetes that she poorly monitors and manages. And she's got poorly controlled hypertension. Sometimes she takes it, sometimes she doesn't take a medicine. Very common. Most folks don't take their medicines the way they should. And then, so the physician uh, sees her and, uh, in his clinic, and, he, and, and as part of his exam, he does a pelvic examination of this patient, and he detects a, an adnexial mass. And an adnexial mass is, 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 is a mass in the pelvis which really usually carries a very, very serious connotations for the patient. And he says, well, this patient, this is probably a cancer. We're going to have to send this patient to the gynecology clinic and get a surgery consult and see what needs to be done. The surgeon examines the patient again and, and says, yes, this is really an issue. We have to go and perform surgery on this patient. But we also need to screen her, make sure what risk she's going to face with the surgery. So she goes off to the pre-op screening clinic and they're concerned about her uh, hypertension and, and various other stories she tells them. So they say, we, we need to get a cardiology consult. And so this all occurs. Uh, so these are a problem. She's got a neck ill mass that requires surgery. She has comorbid diseases. Uh, when she sees the, the pre-op screening unit and the cardiology folks, they say, yeah, she's got, you know, she's got myocardial ischemia. We, we're worried about this patient. We think she needs to go to the cath lab. And so they decide to work her up uh, for a cardiac risk. From the anaesthetic perspective, uh, you know, the cardiac risk is quite, is, is, is quite significant. We, that needs to be addressed before we go to surgery. The second thing is the scleroderma, this, e, this loss of elasticity means her mouth is very tightly, can't be stretched very much. We need to put a breathing tube in this patient to, uh, to allow her to uh, stay alive during surgery. This is a problem for us uh, in the anesthesia world. And then finally, we have these language communication difficulties we have to deal with. And so, this was our management plan. She went to cardiology, she had the CAS study, they detected a problem and they put a stent in the patient, fixed her up pretty well immediately. Uh, she, the anesthetic plan was an airway management plan. How are we going to approach putting this breathing tube in her to ensure that she gets adequate oxygenation during surgery? Because of her heart history and so forth and the fact she's having a big operation, we're going to have to put a monitor, we have to put catheters into her circulation to measure the pressures in her heart and so forth. And finally, the surgical plan is to, uh, to we're pretty high tech here, and most of these pelvic uh, exoneration procedures are done now under robotic laparoscopic surgery. And, and, and that was the surgical plan once, she, once her cardiac problem was fixed. So, so that's it. And things went really well with this patient. Everything went really well. The trick is, this was all virtual. She was handled all the way along the line with, uh, with uh, with uh, medical students and residents taking care of this patient, making decisions about her, learning about what they needed to do to make the right decisions and proceed with this. this. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Betsy, and she can tell you a little bit about how this virtual environment worked in terms of the care of this patient. So this patient really was a virtual patient, and we handled her, we pre-trained her, uh, pre-trained the students that, that managed her all through the lab. So the first thing that had to happen is she had to have a pelvic exam to identify the adnexal mass. So in the center, we have a pelvic trainer 
We also have a similar high-risk trainer that allows the students to not only um, understand how the pelvic exam works, but they also um, develop the ability to interact with their patient because we can move this model um, into what we call hybrid learning so that it would be on an examination table and the patient um, would be a um, actor within the CVC who would be sitting behind the model interacting with the um, examiner. So those core competencies that you saw are constantly being reinforced within the center. The um, examining student comes in and introduces themselves in a professional manner and talks about the procedure that's going to happen. She had to go to the cath lab. Within the CVC, we have the cardiac cath lab trainer. This is where the primarily the cardiology fellows, but anyone else that we need to train in the processes of um, um, cardiac cath placement will actually come and place a stent or a shunt and actually learn not only the physical task of how to pre, um, insert it, but also the screens that you see behind that they're pointing to include um, the patient monitoring so that the person also understands what's going on with their patient. They're treating a whole patient, not just doing line placement. Difficult airway. The patient had uh, presented with a difficult airway. That means an anesthetic plan to manage that. Here, using the video laryngoscope, the student not only um, is practicing airway insertion, but the monitor behind them is showing the instructor what's actually going on. The, they can see whether or not the line is being placed correctly. For a beginning medical student, this is particularly critical. The student often um, looks over the shoulder of the uh, person inserting the airway, and they're asked, can you see the vocal cords? I can guarantee you that no young first-year medical student is going to say no, whether they have a clue as to what they're actually looking at. So this also um, obviates the uh, potential to uh, deny uh, really seeing what they're being asked to look at, because the monitor is showing everything, and the student can actually see the, ana uh, the anatomy much faster. The model that she's working on is just a simply a, uh, an airway model molded on a cadaver, but it, it accurately represents um, the um, anatomy of a person and what the student needs to understand. We had to put in a central venous line. We have such task trainers that using ultrasound um, accurately reflect the position of the um, vein and where the student actually needs to put the needle. This is, this is a really difficult procedure, easy once you've mastered it, but the initial learning is complex. And you have nerves as well as veins and arteries all running parallel to each other. So learning to use the ultrasound, learning to accurately place your needle in a vein and not in an artery, which has major negative consequences, is again part of the learning. Now we move to our patient. This is one of the uh, high-tech simulators that Michael referenced. In fact, uh, the students are now uh, managing them in a surgery um, situation. This group is putting in the airway. The other piece that they are able to actually communicate with this patient. So prior to putting her um, into a, a state to allow the surgery, they were able to ask questions. These patients come with built-in microphones. So they speak, they talk, they respond to whatever the student may be um, asking them. Again, it allows them to move through their training in terms of their core competencies without even realizing that they're practicing that. Lastly, we needed to do the surgery. This particular trainer is um, very much like the gaming trainers. It's a virtual laparoscopic trainer using surgical skill games. We also do move them onto the robotic surgery trainer. Depends on the procedure being done. But this is using real surgical instruments. That's what he has in his hands. He needs to learn to be focused up, not looking down at the patient's abdomen, and go through the um, hand-eye coordination skills that are necessary to complete this. We can tell you, and again, all of you that work in the gaming world, what you're teaching and what the, what the young, um, young generation is coming away from is phenomenal. 
we can take high school students into the lab and have them perform most of these procedures because their hand-eye coordination is um, so fantastic. So as an aside, when you have parents talking to you who tell you that they hate gaming technology, you might mention to them that you're actually preparing them for um, surgery. So our virtual care simulators are very high tech. These are not recessa Annie. This is moving to the holodeck. For all of you that remember Star Trek, we're actually almost there. With the AAMC's um, expectations, this kind of educational technology really allows the students to work in safe, controlled environments. We can tailor it to their needs. It can move at the learner's pace. Um, one of the really neat things we can do is error management. We can encourage the students to make an error, do that decimal um, calculation incorrectly, look at what happens to your patient, how to recover from it, and how you're going to talk to the family. It allows us to standardize the instruction and the assessment of the students, and it really gives a, a repeatable resource that we can use over and over again. These um, environments um, facilitate the learning uh, in a very safe way. The students are not practicing on um, you or your family member. They're using proven uh, technology that has come out of the gaming in industry. It is dynamic. We need that to progress. So those of you that are working in this world, we're very interested in what you're doing because the fidelity and the engineering components, while we call them high fidelity, are still limited. We do have some tactile and haptic feedback. It, again, is still limited, and that's what we really need. So simulation is very much an immersive experience. Um, it is very important to what we're doing now with the students and their um, teaching. It is very realistic to a point. We'd like to marry more of it to the gaming technology. The software programs that um, have been discussed previous to this are critical to where we're going, and it lends itself to working in a broader scope of the um, uh, working with the patient, the patient's family, um, defensive medicine, disaster preparedness. All of this revolves around what we can do with the simulation. So. This is an exciting era. We really appreciate the basic science component of some of what you're doing, and we would love to partner with um, some of you in uh, the technology that you're developing. Thank you very much. There we go. Uh,